Good morning and welcome to this lecture on the critical review for ENG 1205. We're going to be going through the aspects of the critical review and working on thinking about how the critical review is part of the natural progression of the key elements of descriptive and critical writing that you would have developed over the course of the semester. So whereas the summary depended on the ability to accurately describe content that was read and the later weeks depended on argumentation skills that were generally derived from the writer, the critical review is working on putting both of those aspects together and developing a kind of argument that looks outward rather than inward. So I'm gonna be working alongside this PowerPoint, which I'm gonna be bringing up in a few seconds. And we're gonna be going through the elements of the review and thinking about what are the tools that are necessary for effectively working on a critical review and developing your writing skills. So the structure for this particular lecture is gonna be divided in three. We're gonna be looking at what exactly the critical review is, the purpose of the review, types of critical reviews, and the relationship between the critical review and the summary. Then we're gonna be thinking about the critical review as a literary form, what are the variations on the critical review and what are the aspects of balance and ethics that the critical review depends on. And we're gonna be closing by thinking of ways of writing a review and assessing aspects of the tone, form and structure of the review and the language and conventions because this is all part of working towards your ability to understand what a review is, but also your ability to write one and respond to some sort of stimulus. So what I'm gonna be doing then is thinking not just about the review in relation to your work in ENT 1205, but thinking of the ways that a critical review becomes an essential part of your own writing, both in and out of university. So I wanna just briefly bring up this comic here and it's amusing, but also instructive because what is really happening here is that the child listening to this bedtime story is creating a critical review in many ways and even though that term might sound complex or difficult, we want to recognize that a critical review is something that you're all familiar with. Just as we are familiar with the idea of summary, even before we have done it in class, the critical review is part of our daily existence. We're faced with a scenario, an event, a text, and we engage in a critical analysis of it when we evaluate it or analyze it. And of course, our day-to-day -day reviews lack some of the nuance required for a more cogent academic critical review. But the point is that even as you will be working towards developing these skills, these are skills that are already inherent in you because of your cognitive abilities. So the critical review is not something that's beyond your understanding or your level of skill. It's just a matter of you know, developing the skills that you already have and putting them to work in a very specific and isolated kind of writing. So like I mentioned at the opening, like much of this use of English course, the critical review has value way beyond this particular course and the assessment that you'll be doing for this course. You will engage in numerous kinds of critical reviews in the rest of your academic and professional lives. So the information on critical review that we're gonna be doing here is not 
merely part of information to work towards an assessment. It's part of honing essential skills that are necessary for adult communication academically and professionally. So we may as well start by trying to come up with a workable definition of what a critical review is. And this is one that I think works best. I've sort of pulled it together from various sources and I think it can be best summed up by saying that a critical review is an analysis and an evaluation of a text that moves beyond mere summary to provide the reader with the writer's informed opinion of the work under assessment. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but I think it does a fairly good job of clarifying the main aspects of what a critical review is. And the entire definition is valuable, but I want to emphasize three words, analysis, evaluation, and informed. And these three words are key to recognizing that the critical review is not a piece of descriptive writing, but one which demands that the reviewer engage with the text. It's not any sort of distant or remote kind of writing, but instead the reviewer or the writer has to have some sort of stake in what they're reading and responding to. So unlike a regular argumentative essay where the writer's ideas are the nucleus and secondary research functions as the limbs that hang off of that main argument, the critical review has the initial text that is being reviewed as the center. And the reviewer's response to that text, the evaluation and the analysis, emanate from their assessment of that text. So the critical review, to repeat, is not a passive piece of writing. I mean, ideally no writing ought to be passive, but in particular in a critical review, it demands that the reader has a clear, discernible opinion on the text that they are engaging with. Otherwise, the review is going to be lacking. So when I say the word text, I use it deliberately in a non-literal sense. Our work in use of English will be confined to critical reviews of written work, but this is not an essential. A text is anything that can be read or evaluated or analyzed. And a critical review is a chance to put analysis into action by forming a response to the text, which acts as a stimulus. So what I have here is a list, a not exhaustive list of various kinds of texts. These are all things that can be and have been reviewed. Some of you, depending on whatever discipline that you're studying in, might have to review some of them. So a film or a novel, a play, a poem, a song, a textbook, an article, an academic chapter, and so on. So there is a wide gamut of things that may come under review for the person writing the review even as I'm establishing that for the purpose of our course, we are going to be working on reviewing a piece of writing. Now, I'll expand on variations on the review later on in the session, but before I get to those variations, I wanted to think about the essence of a critical review. Why is it of value to us, not just as students or academics, but as readers and as writers, what does a critical review do? Now, beyond the definition which I've shared with you, this first point here is an essential one. A critical review assesses the value of a text. And value is, of course, a complex word in some ways, and it's also a highly subjective one. Critical reviews are forced to balance the subjectivity of the reviewer with reason and ethics, which is why 
certain elements of the critical review depend on the reviewer justifying their claims. And I'll expand on that as we move on. Now, the second point is that the critical review puts a particular text into historical, cultural, academic, or social context. Now, putting the text into context might vary depending on what kind of a review you're doing. It may sound daunting, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to devote hours of research in your critical review. But every text emerges from some particular context and a review, which is putting forward an informed evaluation of that text, is able to shape the perception of how that text fits into the world around it. Thirdly, a critical review provides feedback to the writer of the original text. The academic book review, for example, is one where it is expected that the author will see the review. So that review is intrinsically one that provides some benefit for the writer of the original text. A review might also provide readers of the original text with potential interpretations of it. So, for example, this is often true of film reviews, which, when done right, provide evaluations that may illuminate new ways of thinking about a film or responding to a film. And the final point relates to the first point. The review assesses how effectively a chosen text fulfills its intentions. And that is a question about effectiveness that is central to thinking about how you want to go about writing a review. What are the goals of this text? And does this text do the thing that it set out to do? Now, what I have here is a list of terms and they're not quite synonymous with each other but they do have a symbiotic relationship and you may often hear them being used interchangeably now despite any differences they may have they all are asking a central thing of the writer read and evaluate a text so whether it's called an assessment of a text or a critique of a text an overview, an analysis, an appraisal, they're all coming back to the central idea of asking the reader who becomes the writer to perform an analysis or an evaluation of a text. And you might come across these words in other courses or in your professional lives when you're being asked to do something. And that thing is going to be a kind of a critical review. So I want to think about how the review is different from the summary, which is the first thing we would have done for this course this semester. And summary skills are part of the writing process for a critical review. Since a review requires the reviewer to summarize and establish what it is that they are reviewing. But there are key differences between the two. The most common missteps in student reviews is their inability to provide the necessary critical analysis required, limiting themselves to a descriptive engagement with the initial text. So, whereas a summary restates information in a text, a critical review moves beyond the summary to assess and analyze what is read. A summary presents the main idea and important details, whereas a critical review interprets and judges the main idea and details. A summary maintains a neutral stance in presentation, whereas a critical review provides evidence to support interpretations of the text and provides a response to that information. So I want you to notice the words here, assess, judge, interpret, support, the critical review requires the writer to take information and recontextualize it to provide an appraisal of it. The job here is to literally perform a critique, and critique I'm using it as a verb. And of course, you may want to know what is a critique. I mean, we hear the word 
critic or criticize often in regular parlance, but it has a more nuanced meaning in academia and in writing. What is it to be critical? So in writing, to perform a critical analysis or a critique of something does not mean to say what is bad about it or to lacerate it. Instead, a critique or a critical review is an appraisal or a judgment which comprises both the negative and the positive. Now, a critical review is not objective. I, that's already a word that I'm always skeptical of because so few things in the world are really objective. Instead, what we want to work towards is a situation of informed subjectivity where we defend and support our subjective response with clarity and with evidence. So we're being asked to assess a piece or a text and to respond to it intelligently and with clarity. So even as analysis and evaluation are central, the critical review must be reasonable. It must not be a hit job or a carelessly disingenuous piece of writing. The piece being reviewed must be taken on its own terms and within its own context. So although it's providing analysis and summary, it must conform to reason and fairness. It must be a reasonable analysis of the text and that analysis must keep the context of the original piece in mind. Like you cannot critically review a piece on healthcare in Asia and then criticize it for not being applicable to the Guinea situation. You need to keep the context of the text in mind when you perform your analysis and your evaluation. So I want to look here at some qualities that I think offer a very helpful way of thinking of a review. Uh, I've put the citation at the bottom, uh, Wellington, Batmaker, Hunt, et al. They offer some helpful suggestions on criticality and what elements students should seek when trying to work on criticism at the tertiary level. So let's go through this list of qualities. First, healthy skepticism, but not cynicism. Meaning, essentially, be eternally questioning. If you have no curiosity, then your ability to be an effective critical thinker will be limited. Education demands an inquiring mind, and the critical review requires a reader who questions what they encounter, not cynically, but with a healthy dose of skepticism. Two, confidence, but not cockiness or arrogance. The reviewer must be able to confidently explain to their reader what the central ideas are and why their interpretation is valid and effective. Judgment, which is critical, but not dismissive. So again, that word judgment appears. And the critical review does not dismiss the qualities of the text, but judges with some element of balance and fairness. Opinions without being opinionated. And that sounds like a paradox, but it's not. The reviewer must have an opinion on what they are reading, but they must not meet the text with an opinionated stance before engaging with it. You have to take the work on its own terms before you make a judgment. Because if you come to the work with your own bias about the topic or the content or the writer, it makes your review ineffective and biased. Next, Careful evaluation of published work, not serial shooting at random targets. Now, this particular point might be more applicable for future work on literature reviews where you encounter multiple texts to analyze. But even in the context of a single piece 
to critically analyze or to critically review. The point is encouraging writers to have discernment. So consider the need to recognize what aspects to focus on rather than choosing a random quotation or section that is peripheral to the central focus of the text. You want to instead be careful in your evaluation and hone in on the aspects of that text that are most critical rather than just randomly picking any quote and just dropping it into your essay. There needs to be some amount of thought put into what you're writing about. Next, being fear. Assessing fairly the strengths and weaknesses of other people's ideas and writings without prejudice. Being fair, of course, is subjective, but it is important to work towards balance in your review. Giving a poor review to a well-written text that you do not agree with for moral reasons without acknowledging its strengths would be unethical and would show poor judgment on your part. And the final point is a return to this idea of clarity. Making judgments on the basis of considerable thought and all the available evidence, as opposed to assertions without reason. The critical review, by being an informed piece of writing, supports all claims rather than engaging with wild assertions. So it is essential that you support the claims you are making about what you are reviewing. Otherwise, the claims that you have seem like wild assumptions rather than informed and educated arguments. So just like the critical review encompasses previous topics from this semester, like the summary, it is also engaging with topics like reasoning and argumentation. The critical review is, after all, a kind of an argument. But instead of an argument that emerges from the self, the stimulus is outward. It is the text that you are reading. In some ways, the critical review is kind of like a response. You are responding to the text. And I return to my previous point about the reviewing being dependent on curiosity. To craft a response to a text, you must have an informed opinion that has some sort of value. Now, you're likely to get more specific information on the kinds of review which your discipline would require in your particular faculties and departments. For example, students who are doing art will learn particular skills for reviewing a painting or critiquing a painting. So incorporating techniques like color or brush stroke or light and balance. Whereas a psychology student would encounter theoretical and philosophical concepts and theorists. But the point being here that like in the social sciences, there are certain conventions, in the humanities, there are certain conventions, in law, communications, and so on. And although they each have their differences, all reviews meet at a point that they're all testing a similar skill. They're asking the reviewer to do certain things that require certain skills that are similar even across disciplines. So the question is what it is that makes the critical review helpful for the student? I mean, you're probably thinking, okay, I'm doing this review because I have to required by my class, but there are certain skills that the critical review is assisting you in honing and developing that are essential to your adult life communication skills. One, the review assesses the writing skills of the reviewer. So establishing how you can effectively communicate is a central part of being an adult person. And it is a critical skill for tertiary learning and working in a professional field. So doing a review gives you a chance to develop your writing skills. Next, it assesses the observation skills of the reviewer. Just like with the summary, the reviewer is being tasked with their skills of discernment. 
how observant is the reviewer in recognizing the central aspects of the text and in defending their stance on the text? Next, how is or how effective is the reviewer in understanding what the author of the text is attempting to do? Because the review assesses the comprehension skill, skills of the reviewer. Now, if you, you have poor comprehension skills, then your review would very likely be faulty in establishing what the key parameters of the text are. Next, the critical review trains students to merge summary skills with analysis and deduction. So like I mentioned before, it is a chance to combine various kinds of writing towards a concentrated purpose. Next, it encourages the reviewer to be cognizant of scholarly expectations in their field. And this is important since it prepares you for your role as academics. When you are given an essay or a text to review, you are now being encouraged to learn from the pieces that you critique to improve your own writing skills so that you may write an essay that imitates the essay that you're now being asked to critically analyze or critically review. And finally, you must now consider how context and nuance affects meaning since the critical review challenges the reviewer to develop contextual skills. And contextual skills are an essential part of living in the world, being able to make connections and to draw parallels between seemingly differing concepts and ideas. So these are some questions that the critical review, a good critical review would answer. This is not an exhaustive list. And neither is it a list that every review necessarily has. But what it is, it's a guide that presents some focused questions that a good review will answer, some more compulsory than others. So the first is obvious, but obviously inten intentional and essential. So the review must establish the thing that is being reviewed, just as a summary will. And establishing the author of the text is also essential. In some cases, when a text is written, it's central to our understanding of it. For example, someone writing about healthcare in the world in 2018 would have a very different perspective than right now during our COVID-19 pandemic situation. So in some cases, it is vital to think of when the thing is written to contextualize how your response to it would develop. And if the original text is inspired by a particular concept, then you'd want to think about what are the implications of that stimulus. Next, what is the goal of the text? Sometimes the text explicitly communicates a goal. Sometimes that goal is only implied. Regardless, we must be able to discern that goal. Every piece of writing has a purpose. The writer is trying to do something for the reader and it is up to us to establish and to discern what that intention or that purpose is. The good reviewer assesses whether the purpose is credibly and effectively fulfilled. Next, was it created for general audiences or for a specific audience? Now, some pieces also establish who exactly they are intended for. This can sometimes be helpful in your review as it would explain, for example, use of jargon or niche comments that the general public might not always understand. Next, where does this text exist in relation to other texts in its field? Now, in some cases, you're not required to do this sort of additional information or research. In some cases, it's enough to do a close reading of the prescribed piece and analyze it. But context is always part of anything in this world. And 
in some cases it's helpful to place the work in a particular context to establish where it falls so that you are able to more intelligently and informedly give a response that recognizes the peculiarities or the qualities or conventions of this text within its larger field. And in that vein, you're going to be asking sometimes, is this text breaking new ground? Does it follow a pattern in its field? Is it unusual? Is it heretic? Is it conforming? These are all questions that might be noticeable from a simple close reading, but sometimes additional research, even if it's mild or light research, helps you to qualify and develop your review. Next, this is an essential one. Are there any significant weaknesses or limitations to the text? This is quite self-explanatory and of course it's subjective, but you will support your claims with evidence. This essay is strong. This essay is weak for whatever reason. And finally, are there any potential implications of the text? And when I say implications, what if it's a scientific article or a highly significant philosophical piece, is it projecting something? Are those projections logical? Are they cogent? Are there potential changes in the field that would stem from this particular argument? And you wanna be aware of that if you read the text. And this might be more specific in your differing faculties and department rather than your ENG1205 critical review. So what comprises a critical review? Again, not an exhaustive list, but central things that are of value. One typically makes use of literary presentments. This is not just a weird idiosyncrasy. This is a helpful way of thinking of your writing. Now, when you pick up a text, journal article, textbook, novel, whatever, that text is occurring in present tense for everyone who encounters it. So when you, for example, you're being asked to review a piece written by John Smith. And in his essay, John Smith writes, the education system in the Caribbean is falling apart. You will not write in his essay, John Smith wrote that the education system is falling apart and he supports his argument and he supported his argument with evidence. You would write it in present tense because he's making the argument in a continuous way. So you would say in his 2017 essay, Smith argues that so on and so on and so on. Because the idea is that you're writing about this thing in present tense, unless the text you're writing on is deliberately being historical, you would write it in a historical past tense. But generally, the events of a piece of writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, are written in a continuous present tense. So you would write that Plato argues X, or Derrida argues Y, or Freud says this, Freud opines. If you are writing about multiple texts, and one is from a very long time before the other, you may use the past tense to differentiate. But generally, writing in the literary present tense gives your work a much more effective quality. Like if you pick up a newspaper and read a movie review, you will see that the review is writing about the events of the text in the present tense. Next, the critical review summarizes the main ideas of the text. And of course, it is up to you to be able to discern what the main ideas are. Some writers can be very circuitous and you may not always recognize the main idea immediately. So you need to pay attention and evaluate the text with some amount of care and thoughtfulness. Next, a critical review presents a thesis indicating the reviewer's general response to the text. Yes, 
your critical review has a thesis because there is a central idea that you think about this text. And it's not enough to just say John Smith's article is good. That is not really a effective thesis. An effective thesis would be something like Smith's article on the healthcare system effectively critiques the inefficiency of medicine in the developing world. That's a thesis. The thesis is that he's doing this critique and he's doing it effectively. And you will now support that thesis in the rest of your critical review by pulling up particular aspects of his essay and analyzing and evaluating them. Next, a uh, good critical review provides evidence, like I just said. When you make your claims in your thesis and in the supporting ideas from your thesis, you need to support your claims with evidence. This can be paraphrased, it can be direct quotes, but you need to be ethical. Don't misquote or lie about what the text has. Finally, a good critical review shows evidence of considering the work within its context. Like I mentioned before, if the text is writing about a particular global or social context, you cannot critique him by trying to tie his work to another context and then making him come off worse for that. So you need to be aware of the parameters the text is working in and the way that the writer is working within those parameters and contexts. What does a critical review not have? So, bad faith arguments about the text or the author. You don't want to have a random or a careless response to the text that does not thoughtfully engage with it. Two, overly hostile or antagonistic tone about the subject or the author. I mean, sometimes you may be compelled to write a review of a text that you do not align with, whether it's because of uh, religion or politics, but there is no need, and it's particularly immature to reach out of that work with hostility. You need to have some amount of balance, and I mean one part of being a church, church education is coming into contact with thoughts that are opposed to yours, and you, you should be able to respond to those differing thoughts intelligently. Next, it does not make false claims about the context or the content of the text. That is self-explanatory and it's essential. It does not make unsupported claims about the work. You cannot say X argument is poor and leave it there. You need to support your claim with evidence. Finally, it does not have or make use of fallacious criticism or limitations of logic. So no fallacies, no leaps of logic. It doesn't use poor reasoning. So all of these are no-nos, things that you should not engage with in your critical review. This is an interesting comic here, and it's amusing, but it's an example of what not to do with your review. I mean, this is an anonymous book review scenario, but you need to not try to sink the author. I mean, you may read a text and you may find it very poor and you want to analyze it and critique its limitations, but no text is really the worst text ever written like this particular critic is saying. That's just careless criticism. You want to use your words carefully. I always say that when you're writing, writing is a battle and your words are your weapon. So you need to choose them very carefully. You need to be shrewd and sharp about what words you're using to make your analysis and to develop your arguments. Okay, so we want to move on to the difference in reviewing a single text versus reviewing multiple texts. Now, this is likely to be a bit more applicable to your work in your various 
departments or faculties, but I still wanted to discuss it since it all falls under the remit of the critical review. Now, for the purpose of this course, you will be asked to review a single text, which functions as a close analysis of an individual work. Now, there may be other times you'll be asked to review multiple texts, perhaps a comparative review of two pieces, or the most common type is a literature review, which demands engagement with multiple texts, drawing connections across multiple fields and disciplines. But even as there is variation between a single, dual, or multiple text, the central idea that the critical review demands of the writer remains the same. So in thinking of those similarities and differences, what I wanna do is go through 10 tips that sort of summarize what I've discussed so far and put in, a, I think, a very clearly delineated fashion, different skills you need to be aware of as you work on performing your own critical analysis. This is not an exhaustive list, but I think it sums up at least 10 main aspects you want to recognize and be aware of as you write your own critical review. Because of course, the purpose of this exercise is for you to develop those skills, for you to work on writing your own critical review. So first, Tip one is that you choose a structure that allows you to support your thesis and present the information in a clear manner. There is no one size fits all mode of writing a review. And this is quite clear because you want to recognize that like any kind of writing, there is no one way of doing it. And I think you would have learned this in, over the course of the last two semesters, you've done a lot of writing, writing essays, writing paragraphs, and you would recognize that there is no one way of writing anything. Writing is a personal, it's an idiosyncratic thing. And no matter how many essential elements there are in a particular kind of writing, there is no one format that works for everything or for everyone. The way that your writing style develops in your critical review will depend on so many things. It will depend on your content. It will depend on your purpose. It will depend on your response to the text itself. So you want to recognize that there is no one right silver bullet way of writing your review. Instead, you need to be aware of what you're writing about. Recognize the ways that your thesis might depend on nuanced ways of development and keep that in mind as you work on developing the best format to structure your own personal review. Two, you want to remember that the summary is only a brief part of your review. I think I mentioned earlier that very often students limit themselves by writing an essay that's most descriptive. They do not engage with the text as a critical piece, and it's essential in a critical review that you include criticism. The summary should be at most one quarter of the essay, and sometimes even that seems too much. What you want to have is a summary that effectively establishes what it is that you're reviewing. You don't need to go into excessive detail, it's a summary. The summary is only there for you to jettison off of, for you to use as a springboard to develop your argument and your thesis. Your thesis, it's, it's not the central part of your essay. Your essay is a critical analysis, a critical review. The summary is a part of that. Next, you want to be able to establish your opinion of the text from your review. The reader should be able to read your review and immediately recognize what your stance is. 
However, that opinion or that response should be an informed one rather than a casual one. Now, this might seem self-explanatory, but you need to remember that your review is a kind of writing. There should be no ambiguity in your review where the reader leaves your review and they're not certain what your stance is on the text. Now, it's okay to have ambivalent feelings about the text you're reading. You may not be completely positive nor completely negative, but you still need to be explicit and clear about what your stance is, whether it's mixed, good, or bad. And that stance emanates from your thesis. A reader should be able to read your review and immediately recognize what it is that you feel about this text and you can develop that from there. There shouldn't be any confusion or any sort of doubt as to what you think of the text. Next, you want to remember that you, especially in university circumstances, if you're writing a review, it falls under the academic parameters. So rules of style and grammar, measured tone, no casual use of language. These are all critical aspects of academic writing that you need to be aware of. And you must recognize in writing your review. Next, you want to make specific references to parts of the text through quotes or paraphrasing. And you want to ensure that the parts extracted are relevant. Like I said before, an effective review illustrates the arguments by bringing particular examples from the text. You don't want to overquote. Don't pad your review with multiple extracted quotes to bulk it up. What you want to do is have two or three essential quotations that really emphasize the point that your review is making and you want to include them there. And on that note, you want to ensure that you make use of your paraphrasing skills. You don't need to quote everything directly. You can utilize paraphrasing to qualify your argument, to show the reader that yes, you have understood and discerned the context of the original text, and you are able to paraphrase it accurately and ethically. You want to make sure that your paraphrasing is not misrepresenting the text that you are reading. And this is a skill that comes with practice, and it's also a sign that you have the observational and comprehension skills to effectively review the text in question. Now, sometimes additional research on the writer of the text can helpfully inform your critical review, but this is not always so. And you want to recognize when you are adding information that is not essential. When you write your essay and your thesis is there, your thesis is what everything is going to be hanging off of. And if information about the background, nationality, race of the writer is not adding to your thesis, it either, mean, it either means that your thesis is ineffective or your paragraph is unnecessary. And you want to be very shrewd about your development. You don't want to include information that does not move your argument forward. The point of every paragraph and every sentence is to move your essay forward. If it's keeping your essay lagging and it's not moving, you're not developing it. And it means that that part is unnecessary and needs to be extracted from your essay. Eight, you want to ensure that you review the text that the author has written, not the text that you wish they had written. This is a very common issue that pops up in many reviews. The reviewer has certain ideas about what the ideal text would be. And so they write their review complaining about what the text does not do instead of taking the text at its own value and analyzing that text. Now, there may be some limitations where the text sets out to do something and it doesn't do this, so you want to point out something it misses. But if a writer establishes his parameters and those parameters are not ones that you like, you cannot critique him for not doing what you wish he ought to have done. You need to recognize the 
context the writer is putting forward his work in and you need to criticize and critique those parameters not the parameters that you wish that the writer was focusing on no matter what form the review is taking you are answering a central question that question is is this text effective at achieving its goal like i mentioned the goal or the purpose is sometimes explicit very often implicit but once you establish what that purpose is you want to know answer the ultimate question does this text effectively do what it intends to do and you will obviously support your claim with evidence with supporting data to support your argument and you want to remember that no matter what form your review takes there is one central point you want to make about the text being reviewed and that central point is your thesis does your review prove your thesis to repeat from earlier your thesis is what every paragraph of your essay is hanging on to. you're making an argument at the end of your essay you are going to be communicating to the reader that i believe that this particular text is xyz so you want to ensure that your thesis clearly establishes what your stance is on the text and your supporting paragraph support and prove that thesis i just want to briefly turn to parts of the review like i said the review structure and form is dependent on your task and on your writing style but generally your essay is going to have an introduction a body and a conclusion your introduction will state the thesis it will identify the purpose of the text and it will establish the context of the text that you are reviewing your body will have arguments supporting that thesis logical development and analysis of ideas in the text and quotations and illustrations that support the central thesis your conclusion will summarize the review summarize thesis and paraphrase and qualify your ultimate finding and stance on the text all in support of a clear and cogent argument now just like any kind of writing the critical review is a chance for you to use paragraphs as a way of strategically developing your thesis your critical review makes use of descriptive writing which includes summarizing and illustrating content as well as critical writing which includes analyzing and evaluating i'm repeating myself but repetition is, is a part of learning the majority of your paragraphs will be critical writing and not descriptive writing and you want to ensure that each critical paragraph is fulfilling three major functions. One, you want to establish a central point. In his essay, John Smith says X. Then you provide evidence to show the relevance of that point. John Smith says X, or John Smith effectively does X, and he does so by this example. And then you analyze and evaluate the implications of your point. Why is this good development of the argument important or significant? How does it prove that this text is a good piece of writing or a weak piece of writing? There's an example here we can look at. It's from an essay, it's a book review of a nonfiction piece and now in this example we see that Guine is writing a paragraph where he is establishing certain weaknesses in this particular text and his concluding statement is that despite the weakness this is a good text and i think this is a very good example to think about because even the best essay or text that you encounter will have certain limitations and you want to be able to establish the weaknesses of an excellent text while acknowledging that it's still good. 
you don't want to gloss over or, or ignore limitations in a good piece of writing. And similarly, you don't want to ignore positives in a weak piece of writing. Your critical review needs to maintain balance, and that balance comes recognizing both the strengths and the weaknesses of whatever you're encountering. And looking at the way that Guiné worked from pointing out the limitations, but concluding his paragraph by saying, but these are quibbles and in no way detract from the book's value as a sensitive overview of solitude in Western society. So he points out his issues, but returns to his central point, which is part of his thesis, which is that this text is a sensitive look at solitude in Western society. This is another example here from a shorter book review. In this particular paragraph, Rokash is arguing that this text that's being reviewed is a good text because it's doing something unusual. And right there, she establishes what it is. Psychology publications commonly do not address that issue, meaning the issue of urban living conditions. And it is refreshing to read it in a volume prepared and edited by psychologists. So like I was mentioning earlier, sometimes in reading a text on its own, you may recognize that certain arguments are unusual, groundbreaking, revolutionary. And because Rokash has the knowledge and has done the research on the field, she is able to critique this particular text by pointing out why and how what it's doing is groundbreaking and innovative. And that comes by having an awareness of the context that the piece is being written in. And it's that awareness of context that is very important in thinking about how it is that what you are reviewing functions in the larger social, cultural, or academic field. So in summing up what we've learned, I mean, this is not an exhaustive class. There are so many other things about critical reviews you may think about. And I'm going to be attaching some extracts from chapters to supplement what we have covered. But I think we have established the central aspects that are most critical for your understanding and developing of your own critical review. You want to remember that this is an amalgamation of all that you've learned over the last two semesters. Well, especially this semester. So your summary writing skills, your development of deduction and reasoning, your ability to recognize limited or fallacious arguments and your argumentation skills, they're all being put into one to create your response to another writer. I always tell students that the best way to improve your writing is to read. And writing a critical review is a chance for you to put that into practice. When you read a critical, read an essay to critically analyze it, to critically review, you are now being tasked with looking for the strengths and the weaknesses of an established writer. And with that same amount of thoughtfulness that you attach to that critical review, you will want to learn to critically analyze your own writing. Because what the critical review does is that it teaches you to be discerning of writers' issues. And as you develop your skills as a reviewer, you will be able to develop your skills as a writer, all towards making your writing at a tertiary level more effective, more cogent and more emphatic.